That is Professor Flint singing Mary Anning. But you might be asking the question, who is this amazing woman you may never have heard of, Mary Anning? Answering that question is the man behind Professor Flint himself, uh, Michael Mills, creative director of Heaps Good Productions and also known as Professor Flint, Dean of Science at Dinosaur University. Welcome to you, Michael Mills. That all sounds very fancy. Happy New Year. And we've made it to day two of 2023, which is good. Without too much drama. Without too much drama. And um, yes, so who was Mary Anning? Good question. Now, she has an amazing history. She's led an amazing life. She is responsible for an amazing amount of discoveries. And many of us would never have heard of her name. Yes. So Mary lived couple of hundred years ago, uh, was born in 1799 and in, in Lyme Regis in, in England and was born into a, a very poor family. Her father was a carpenter. Um, so she was born into a class that was never going to be able to go to university. She was born as a woman who was never going to be allowed to go to, to join things like the London Geological Society. But her father would take her down to the beach and they would discover these remarkable, uh, they, they'd find ammonites and fossils. seashells and fossils and things. Yeah. Uh, he died when she was 11. Um, and from then, she there's this moment in her life where the day after the funeral, she's walking back from the beach. She'd gone down to the beach to reflect on him. She's walking back from the beach. She'd found a fossil. And this lady, this tourist comes up to her and says, oh, what have you got there? And she says, oh, it's a fossil. Can I buy it? And so she sells it for a couple of shillings. And she's gone, this is this is... This is how I can. This is how we, as a family, can survive. Her brother and her mother and her were able to survive uh, through the sale of a whole bunch of discoveries that she made. But why was it that she was doing the discovering, and not others? Like they recognised what she had was valuable. Um, it seems unusual to me that there were. An, I mean, let's face it, women weren't encouraged in that area. So why weren't there a whole lot of men doing that? Because she was better at it than them. Right. She was self-taught. She, there's a, when you, because I get to play Professor Flint, um, I get to go on paleontology digs and there's a moment when you're on a paleo dig where you get your eye in, where you're able to see things that if you, if you walk in for the first time, you can't see them. Um, it's like if somebody tells you, you know, if you buy a red car, all of a sudden you start seeing red cars. Her eye was perfect in being able to find the things that she could find, but it was also the level to which she was able to, to, to extract the fossils and do the prep work. It was her understanding of biology. She dissected um, recently deceased animals to find out how they worked so that she had something to compare now animals with the past animals. She was one of the first people that understood that animals went extinct. So at the time that she was around, um, people thought that creation was perfect and an animal couldn't go extinct. So if you found a fossil of an ichthyosaur somewhere, that just meant that it lived somewhere else in the world and we hadn't found it yet. So she was one of the first people to go, look, these animals are gone. So she had these really fascinating insights. And a lot of the men at the time, there's a really famous quote from her where she talks about the men at the time basically gorging on her brains um, oh. and and using the things that she had discovered. So so she was aware that she was being used. Oh, she, she was aware. And what I love about her story is that she kept on going and kept on making these remarkable discoveries. I mean, it's 200 years this year. So in 1823, at the age of 24, she found the first complete plesiosaur fossil of before anyone else in the world. She found... Uh, pterosaurs, flying reptiles. She found she was one of the first people to realise that there was such a thing as fossilised poo, <laughs> coprolite. So she, but she wasn't able to do uh, to, to write scientific papers because she wasn't a member of the societies because she was a woman and she was a woman in poverty. That said, there were some key men at the time. Um, like William Buckland, uh, like um, de Cuvier, who created this. Uh, uh, Cuvier, who was a, a Frenchman, who initially thought the plesiosaur was fake and then suddenly realised, oh, this is real. They would visit her. 
so people from Europe, princes from Europe, the, the lead academics of the time would visit her and walk along with her along the beach because her eye was so good and her understanding of what these things were was so remarkable. And presumably she was self-taught if she yes. wasn't allowed to go yep. to university. Now, if that initial introduction was by her father, after the age of 11 or 12, that was a self-driven Design, Absolutely. From the sounds of things. Absolutely. So he seems to have and, and what's really interesting, I think, with the relationship with her father is that this is this is a he is he is taking her on a tradition on a non traditional pathway by you know, she's not playing with dolls. <laughs> she's not doing the kind of things that a seven or eight or nine year old girl would have been doing at that time. She's clambering up the cliffs with him. So I think that's I, th- I think we give credit to him, but credit to her. For following up, mm. she also had some some really interesting um, uh, female friends, uh, Elizabeth Philpot and her sisters, that were also discovering fossils at the time. So it's a remark. So, so what I love about Mary's story is is that it's the story of somebody who was defiant in her curiosity, who was persistent, but it's also the discoveries themselves. Uh, you're listening to uh, Michael Mills. He's from Heaps Good Productions. He's the director there, and. Um there is a, a fringe show that's going to be focusing on the life of Ma- um, um, uh, Mary Anning. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yes, Mary yeah, Anning. Well I, I doubted myself for a moment there. Uh, Mary Anning is a name that you may not be super familiar with. That's why we thought we'd learn a little bit more about her story before we look into, into the production I- itself. You mentioned she came from poverty. Yep. She was a woman and couldn't get into university, and yet people were coming to her. Why was she being listened to, Michael? Who, what made her discoveries um, pop up amongst academia that they started paying attention to what she was doing? Look, that's a really, really interesting question, and and I think it's because they knew that she clearly knew what she was talking about. So that that. And, and it happened that there was there was um, uh, a guy Henri de la Beck, who lived in Lyme Regis, who was a great supporter of hers as well. Who there's a there's a famous illustration that he did, and it's the first illustration anywhere in the world of a prehistoric scene, and it's got plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs swimming as if it's a photograph from you know 150 million years ago. So he he learnt from her. And he ended up being the the president of the London Geological Society, so so there were some connections there. So she she walked with people who were wealthy. She spoke with them. She spoke with people who were academics. She had so so William Buckland, who was the lead geologist at the time, he came to her for advice. He would acknowledge her when he was giving talks at the Geological Society, but her name doesn't appear in the papers. So when she sells the things, and she's done all the prep work, and she's written and explained to all of these people what the stuff is, then then the connection to her kind of fades and disappears. And so over a period of time, we lose her story. Whereas in the last few years, um, we were lucky enough to be part of a campaign uh, through the first Mary Anning song I ever did to help raise awareness and money for a statue that now exists for Mary in in England, How in her wonderful. hometown, because there was no statue. So an eight-year-old kid, Evie Squire, um, her mother, who was a 10-pound pom in Adelaide 30 years ago, 40 years ago, um, but moved back to England, she was they're walking down the beach one day and Evie said, oh, can you take me to the to the statue of Mary Anning? And her mum's gone, there is no statue. And Evie got so angry as an eight-year-old, they raised over £150,000 to build this statue, which was unveiled last oh, year. She, so, sound, she sounds like she's got the spirit of Mary Anning uh, oh, right absolutely. there and then. <laughs> so so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a growing uh, awareness of her story. But her story is intertwined with her discoveries. And what I like about her discoveries too... Um, and I think you, you, you talked about the South Australian Museum earlier today, mm. is that is that in the collections of the South Australian Museum are plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, ammonites, all from the Cretaceous period here in South Australia. What Mary found was from the Jurassic period. So there's a really nice connection between what she discovered from that's older compared with what we have found here in South Australia. So, again, there are those sorts of things. When you're working on a show... 
all of those things that kind of start resonating and going, this is a, this is a story to tell. Yeah. Uh, Debit McGill on the text line says, in September this year, I went to England. I spent a day near Lynn Regis. Lime. Lime, Lime Regis. Regis, sorry. Yep. Fossicking for fossils on the Jurassic Coast. I was delighted to find ammonites and other fossils on the beach. It is a beach where the public is allowed to do this. So I'm, I'm guessing Deb is, is fairly interested herself. Um, another asks, is Mary Anning behind the tongue twister? She sells seashells by the seashore. Now, I've read this is the case. Is that true, Michael? It is an excellent question. It is probably more myth than reality. In the Mary Anning song that, that I wrote, the first one, there's a there's a bridge that goes, she sold seashells by the seashore. She did a lot of that and a whole lot more. So she probably sold seashells, which is why the poem seems to have kind of gravitated towards her. It probably wasn't. But for all intents and purposes, it kind of now is connected to her mm. because of the telling of the story. So... You are bringing this story to life uh, through your show, A Curious Thing, the story of Mary Anning as part of the Adelaide Fringe. But where did your interest in Mary Anning start? Because as you were highlighting, her story has been in a way lost for some time. So, yeah, look, as Professor Flint, I get to hang out with a whole bunch of paleontologists from around Australia and, and around the world. Dean and, of Science at Dinosaur University, just oh, for yes. those who aren't just, familiar just with Professor Flint. Just quietly. Yeah. And, um, and so her story kept coming up and, and I, wanted, I wanted the prof to have a science hero and it was very easy for her to become his science hero. Um, and it's always really interesting when I'm doing sessions at the museum as the prof and I start just, talking... Just for people who aren't aware, uh, Michael, you do a lot of different um, creative things through our cultural institutions. Yes, yeah, yeah. Wonderful places to do theatre and interpret stuff. Um, so, so, yeah, so she became his, his hero. And then I heard about the, the statue and I thought, I have to get off my bottom and write a Mary Anning song... And then that song led to, so Gemma, who's uh, in the video clip for that, is an amazing performer. Um, that then led to her and I making an album of yeah. songs. Um, and about then, Mary. About Mary. Yeah. Uh, and the album's a curious thing. And you can find it on it's Spotify. It's not called There's Something About Mary, is it? No. No, it is not. <laughs> Definitely not. Just to clarify. Um, and then that led to, as we were working on the, the album, that led to the, the idea for the show. Now, Gemma's Brisbane-based at the moment because she's studying this year her third year in musical theatre. And so we started thinking, well, well, what's a different way of exploring the story of Mary? So started talking with Michelle Nightingale, who's a brilliant, brilliant performer uh, that many of your listeners would know. And we thought, really like the idea of, of Gem as, and, and the album as young Mary and Michelle as an older Mary reflecting and considering her legacy and looking back at the things that she's been through. So there's a whole bunch of new songs in addition to a few songs from the album that are in the show. Um, and and it's been a fascinating show for me to develop because, uh, you know, I've, I've spent time talking with Liz Reed from Flinders Uni and a whole bunch of the women in Paleo from there. Um, we're on opening night, the 22nd of February, you see the show, and it's at Ayers House, by the way. <laughs> cool venue, just yeah. saying. And a really cool hub, a really cool hub for the Fringe too. Um, but so at the end of opening night, straight after the show, you stay for another half an hour or so because we have a panel of some amazing women, Liz Reed, Dr. Alice Gorman, who your listeners would know. Dr. Space archaeologist. Absolutely. What a, what a business card. Um, <laughs> Dr. Tatiana Suarez de Costa, who's the tall poppy scientist of the year. So they're all going to be talking about their science, but also the legacy of Mary Anning and what's changed in a couple of hundred years. For women years. in science, I'm Absolutely. guessing. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but it's also, it's a, it's, this is the show for everyone. And what, so, so there are some Saturday 11 a.m. shows, Bring the Family. Um, it's, it's, it's probably so not a show for something toddlers. That- no, yeah. but kids can will come and learn and be part of this. Absolutely, yeah. and have fun. And so the only other boy on the project team is Steve Hayter, who made all of the stuff down at Narrow Court, and he's making some props of some things. And so as well as some real fossils, you'll see some really cool replica things as the story unfolds. So it's very much about, the, the as, as well as Mary's story, it's very much about the science in the story. Um, and, and as I say, it, it's, it's a it's a family show um every show for me at the fringe is a work in progress 
And what we want to do after this is like we'll see what worked and tweak things and and turn it into mm. a bigger production. Because this is the first time people will see this show. Uh, yes, this has is the, the Adelaide exclusive or the world, world exclusive premiere. <laughs> <laughs> it's called A Curious Thing: The Story of Mary Anning. It's brought to you by Heaps Good Productions. So you can buy tickets now. Presumably you can buy on the fringe now. site. Yeah. So if you just go to the fringe ticket site and you if you if you type in Mary in the search engine. It'll find it, or yeah. Mary Anning, it'll, it'll, it'll find it. So you're going to learn stuff. You're going to find out about an amazing woman who defied her time, her gender, her um, her state in status in life. Yep. To give us some of the world's most amazing scientific um, discoveries, absolutely paleontology and there's a, discoveries. There's a moment in the show where where the character Mary gives somebody in the audience a 150 million year old ammonite. Every show, just saying. But you have to be a real one, in the, a real one, not a pretend one, not a pretend one, a real one. But you have to come to the show. You've got it all, haven't you? Wow. <laughs> a few people on the text line are saying the movie Ammonite with Kate Winslet is the story of Manny, Mary Anning. Yeah. Look, Someone's not very happy with that film, though. Said so they've made it into a romance drama rather than a scientific one. I think this. So, so I haven't seen Ammonite, the movie. Um, I think. For me, the story of Mary Anning, you don't need to to to, to sex rely it up on it. No, you don't need to all. sex it up. Mary's Mary's story is extraordinary enough without having to have romance in it, whether it's romance with a boy or a girl or a badger. And on that <laughs> note, please head along to this family friendly show. I should probably leave now. <laughs> Michael Wills, thank you for your time. <laughs> <laughs> 